passed away in uh, uh, yeah. the Good afternoon. We are here today to pay tribute to the first women of Yale College, 575 trailblazers who came through Phelps Gate in 1969 and changed this university forever. This is where we find a fitting place to honor them, to honor you. We've chosen this spot because it is where many Yale students historically have begun their Yale careers as they move into old campus. And it is where they march out onto the world amidst music and banners and cheering crowds following commencement. And this is not far from where the first building of the collegiate school in New Haven, now called Yale, was raised over 300 years ago. In this place, rich with Yale history, we remember that every barrier broken is both an end and a beginning. The first women of Yale College inaugurated a new era. Their legacy is all around us, in classrooms and in residential colleges, in the lives of distinguished alumni, and in the nation and world they helped shape. Now it is represented on our campus. Today, with the dedication of this 50th anniversary commemorative stone, we honor their courage and commitment. We remember their spirit and resilience, your spirit and resilience. We thank them. We thank you for being the first. As we join together with students, faculty, alumni, and staff here and around the globe, we look with optimism to future generations who will, like the extraordinary first women of Yale College, carry forward Yale's mission of light and truth into the world. And now it is a great privilege to introduce my friend, Elizabeth Alexander, a 1984 graduate of Yale College, a prize-winning poet, essayist, educator, and scholar. Ms. Alexander is the president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. She is a former longtime faculty member at Yale, where she was the inaugural Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry and the chair of the African American Studies Department. She received an honorary degree of letters from Yale in 2008. Please join me, join me in welcoming Elizabeth Alexander. It is a privilege once again to welcome you back home. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Peter. It is such an honor to be here. And I know we want to see what's here. But I am very honored to have been asked to deliver some real remarks. So uh, it, it'll take a minute, but it's a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. Meditations on co-education. I've been thinking about the difference between evolution and revolution. Evolution moves forward in unfolding time, and over time, the organism changes. There is all the time in the world to catch up. That's evolution. Revolution is a sharp turn, an about face, occasioning acceleration. Some things need to be done decisively and happen fast. Sometimes places and people and ideas need to be jolted forward into the present tense so the organism can continue to grow and flourish. Both have their time, place, and utility. Admitting undergraduate women to Yale was the revolution that brought this institution forward. The rest has been evolution, but first the university needed to take a sharp turn into the future. 
The first classes of women to attend Yale, those women that we honor with this celebration, were tough stalked and bold, to use the words of the poet Robert Hayden. Seeds had been planted earlier with women who were pioneers in the graduate schools like Pauli Murray and Grace Hopper. I have always felt particularly inspired by Otelia Cromwell, the first black woman to earn any degree from Yale and the first black woman to earn a PhD in English anywhere in 1926. Her example and history have always felt proximate to me because since careers in, in, as professors in schools like Yale were not open to black women in 1926, she went on to teach at Dunbar High School, the renowned black academic high school in Washington, D.C., where one of her students was my beloved grandmother, Winona Logan. I grew up being trained and corrected in my language and grammar and reading habits by my grandmother, who attributed every rule to Otelia Cromwell. <laughs> She has been memorialized by Smith College, where she was the first black female undergraduate, and indeed, Smith College has an entire Otelia Cromwell day, though I dare say Miss Cromwell dis would disdain the fact that on that day, there are no classes. <laughs> and here, uh, at last, there are not one but two portraits of her, just making sure it sticks. There isn't a lot on her in the alumni files, but we do have her dissertation, and combing the alumni files for any sense, further semblance of the woman is a letter that she writes on October 5th, 1922 to the Yale Athletic Association, requesting two tickets for the Harvard-Yale game. If I may have the privilege of buying tickets, she wrote, will you send me an application blank? It is noted for alumni records that she became a member of the board of directors who would have charge of what was called an Encyclopedia of the Negro, a project undergone by W.E.B. Du Bois. From 1939 forward, her name is listed in a special card file that I have seen with my eyes, a card labeled Negroes who attended Yale. And in other places on the record, she's identified as colored. While studying in New Haven, Cromwell lived at 65 Edgewood Avenue, and a letter that she wrote to her father, summer of 1922, gives a wonderful description of graduate study, but also of a savvy woman scholar making her way. And to read just a little bit, while I am back in New Haven where at least the nights are cool after hot days, I have a large room facing west with three windows. In the mornings, I work in the Yale Library, which is a quiet, roomy place in the summertime. In the afternoons, I work in my room that is at present while I am making a general survey of my subject, and it is possible to bring enough reading material home from the library to occupy me for several hours. Later on, when my work becomes more detailed, involving a ceaseless verification of opinions from many sources, I shall be compelled, I think, to do all of my reading in the library. Although I am not absolutely certain, I shall not know for sure until the department approves, I think I shall work on some phase of Elizabethan drama. From many points of view, it would be more comfortable to select a subject relating to the Negroes, but two difficulties stand in the way. The improbability of my being able, from what I know of the possibilities of the field, to get something that would be big enough for the kind of book I've got to write. And more importantly, the fact that any work which I might do in that line would be absolutely independent, because naturally I'd know more about it than any of the folks here. <laughs> in one way, the independent work would show a certain kind of power. But on the other hand, my main object in being here is to learn scholarly method and to benefit by scholarly criticism. Most of all, I want the work I may do in the years to come, if years are granted me, to be critically sound. I am glad that I have a sense of values. Ambition for place or fame is not my besetting folly. I wish to do work that I like, time to keep unembittered study, and perhaps to do this writing someday. That aspiration and making a place for herself in a place that was not supposed to be her place is what the women we celebrate today did years later in community. I am proud to have arrived as an undergraduate in 1980 in the wake of this first generation with their revolutionary example lighting the way. When my classmates and I arrived, it was incredible for us to think that the first class with women had graduated only a few years before. 
To ground us in that moment, 1980, Yale didn't have a woman department chair until three years be before we came, nor a female provost, nor a female president, of course. Women Rhythm played its first concert when we were undergrads. The women's sports team captain's pictures were first placed on the walls of Maury's in the 80s. The women's studies major was approved our sophomore year, despite the fact that an English professor submitted petitions to the faculty referring to it as, quote, the Department of Grossness. That is true. Um, revolutionary changes beget natural evolution. You don't know when you set foot in a place if you will belong to it for the rest of your life. When you meet someone and are enchanted and even when you come to love them, you cannot know who will be there for the long road. You cannot know how the self who enters a place and comes in and then out the other side is changing, emerging, becoming herself. You don't know which places you will forever belong to. Even the most venerable and solid institutions, the most resourced and tradition bound, are not static. I love that I could, for example, as a Yale English major of any given decade could do, recite from the first lines of the Canterbury Tales, and that I could do it together with many of you and reach back centuries. We won't do it right now, but we could do it right now. But here's the point, we belong. We took those words into our bodies, we held them, we said them, we believed them as we took joy in the mastery of memory. We are all in part those words, but we are other words too, other rituals, other common denominators. We are not one text we never were. We belong to an evolving entity that believes in the strong spine of certain traditions, but also evolution. Yale has changed. You have helped change it. It will continue to change. Yale was our place to learn from, to demand from, to shout at. And of our school, I have seen it evolve, lucky to come back and teach for 15 years and see amazing young people full of brilliance and hope and challenge and verve who knew because of the path-breaking work of this generation that they were at an institution that had survived revolutions and evolutions and that it was their responsibility to be part of that dynamic process. And I am also proud right now to have my own two sons, my feminist sons, studying here, unable to imagine that they ever could have gone to school without women or been taught only by men or not read books by all kinds of different people. They literally can't imagine it. So Yale, men today are feminists too. I think that evolution is truly possible when we understand that this place that was not founded to educate the majority of us is our place too. Together, out of all of our experiences, we are one alumni body. And even though we have had moments where we've been on the cusp of huge and uncomfortable change, this place is ours. I think that one of the most important things I learned as an undergraduate at Yale that has guided me through my life, that I feel that from this generation, these sunflowers I learned, is how to be a productive outsider at a place I was inside of. The gift of being marginalized is that you have to see kaleidoscopically. The gift of being marginalized is that you always know who is not in the room and how precarious membership can be. That gift teaches that bringing others into the room is our responsibility, however we may find a way to do it. And so for the sunflowers, the classes of 71, 72, and 73, I hope these few days have been beautiful. I hope they have been full of somatic remembering, feeling the first tiny cool undercurrents of fall in New Haven, tilting your heads just so to look up at the tops of these buildings in the sunshine, turning right or left by instinct when you enter various buildings, being glad that there are now more bathrooms uh, that you can go into, <laughs> thinking about the good and the bad of it, the glory and the struggle, the vaulting force of what it feels like to burst into a new stage of your own development in a place that never leaves us to which we belong 
and to which we will hopefully all keep coming back as citizens. We weren't taught by enough women, but we were taught by legends like Sylvia Arden Boone and Marie Boroth. We didn't read many books but written by women. There weren't enough of us in the classrooms at the time, but you all came here and you left your mark and you learned and you took that learning out into the world and you changed this place and you left your names metaphorically and now literally on the walls and on the, on the ground. Learned what it was to change an institution and help it revolve, ev evolve as part of your responsibilities and I believe it took a revolution to do that. I want to close with this short poem by Mur Muriel Rukeyser, one of the best poets I know on evolution revolution, and the carefully observed small moments that make history. And this poem is called Painters. In the cave with a long ago flare, a woman stands, her arms up. Red twig, black twig, brown twig. A wall of leaping darkness over her. The men are out hunting in the early light. But here in this flicker, one or two men painting and a woman among them. Great living animals grow on the stone walls. Their pelts, their eyes, their sex, their hearts. And the cave painters touch them with life, red, brown, black. A woman among them painting. Thank you very much. Thank you. In September 1969, the first women undergraduates arrived on campus. With spirit and determination, these women of the classes of 1971, 1972, and 1973 transformed life and learning in Yale College. And everybody has the excellence.